Good afternoon. I almost forgot I was doing the workshop. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I'm, I'm ready, I'm ready, ready, ready. So today, um, it's a, it's, we're, we're not doing a plenary, we're doing a workshop. Yeah, because uh, Pastor Carlo uh, and wanted to talk about a, a different thing. He wanted to talk about um, church structure. Okay, so, um, so the topic is called, Who is the Boss? Okay, so turn to your neighbor and says, Who's the Boss? Yeah. yeah, who's the boss? And I thought this had nothing to do with Back to Basics, but actually it does. Because we don't know who the boss is, we don't know who the authority is. So I thought this was very good. So I'm a trained school teacher, I actually teach um, chemistry. Um, so I give you a quiz, okay, a qu not a chemistry quiz, but uh, a bo uh, a boss quiz. So take out a piece of paper or in your folder somewhere, and you don't have to write the sentences down, you just write the answer, okay? So the question is, it's a seven, uh, seven questions. Um, and whether you get 100 right or not, is, it's okay, it's, it's grace. <laughs> so take the, um, take the next uh, five minutes to do this quiz, okay? In your church and ministry, who makes the final decision? Who makes the final decision in these seven aspects? Number one, who decides whether to buy or rent a church building? Who makes that decision? So you can just put either a name or the position or whoever, okay? Number two, who decides the number of new staff? Who decides we need three pastors in this church? We need three secretary. Who decides all these information? Number three, who decides whether to start a new children's program? <laughs> and the pulpit schedule, the color of the new carpet? <laughs> Let's say your church needs new carpet, who decides on the color? And there's been some church splits because of this, you know, sometimes. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then six is the salary of the pastor and the staff. Who decides how much people are paid? And then seven is the yearly budget. Who decides how much money the church will spend? Okay, so take a moment and, and do this quiz. Okay, another moment for the quiz. Okay, I, at the end of the session, I will tell you the answers about, about how our church does it. <laughs> okay, so th there's no right or wrong. There's no right or wrong, but it really helps to clarify. So I, as you look at these seven items, I hope it's, you hope to begin thinking about these things as well. And so today's topic is who's the boss? And who decides these things in the church? And um, I'll ask you later. And so I call it church governance or church. Church governance is who governs a church, who makes decisions in the church. Okay? And I want to tell you who's the boss, okay? A church governance is not, it is not positions of power. Okay? It's not positions of power. And church governance is not political. <laughs> I know you're having elections very soon, but church governance is not the same thing as like um, the, the national government. There's a different purpose, okay? And church governance is not uh, controlling the people and controlling the money, okay? So it's not about that. Um, so church governance is not these things. And the reason, um, why is church governance so important? Um, for most of us, maybe as lay leaders, we think decision making is somewhere done at the top. It doesn't relate to us, but actually it does. And church, I believe church governance is so important. Why is it important to know the answers to those questions? Why is it important to know the answer of who makes decisions for those seven items? And I ask you again, <laughs> turn to your partner and try to give me the answer. Why is church government, governance so important in a church? Why is it important? Why is it important to know who is the boss for different decisions in the church? Okay, so I've given Echo um, the power and the boss to decide who will volunteer the answer. So he's the boss now. So he will give you the microphone. <laughs> okay. <laughs> 
Uh, um, good afternoon, Pastor Andy. So according to my discussion with a very handsome pastor, Pastor, yeah. pastor <laughs> Philip, <laughs> so why is church governance so important? Number one, it's, it's important because uh, we need to know where the, the decisions would, would come from if there is any um, arguments or anything that, we, uh, that has to be decided when inside the church. Mm. We know who, who, uh, who to go up to or who to... In, to who to inquire with. Another reason why church governance is so important because it provides structure to the church. Without governments, there, there would be no structure. And without, without structure, the church wouldn't be able to function properly. Wow. Wow. Very good. Give him a hand, please. Thank you. So you mentioned many things. The church cannot function. You don't know who's making decisions. All great. Uh, <laughs> 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 it's uh, important so that uh, uh, we know who's in charge of that so that uh, we, uh, when things uh, go wrong we know who's, uh, who's to blame <laughs> <laughs> that's great when things go wrong you know who to blame yeah <laughs> who makes this decision <laughs> Just to wake you up. Yeah. And, when and, they, and of course, our God is a, a God of order. So that's why yes. we, need, we need a structure and an order. And I have a follow-up question. So when you find out who's to blame, what do you do with that person? <laughs> Fire them? No, I don't know what to do. It. I cannot do that. Yeah, you cannot they do eliminate that. themselves. <laughs> Thank you so much. So much wisdom. So much wisdom. So number one, church governance is so important so you know who to blame if something goes wrong. And the second one was, was from the word of God. Is, um, God is a God of order. God is a God of order. He's not a God of, of chaos. Okay, let's get one more. Volunteer echo. Uh, for, our group, for our group pastor, uh, church governance is important because for efficiency and efficacy of the church to function and to fulfill its purpose and mission. And also, uh, legally, in the legal point of view, daw, sabi niya. <laughs> because the church as a whole cannot decide, so it should have a governing body to decide for the yes. whole church. Very good. So if there's a governance issue, there is transparency. These are all very, very good answers. Thank you so much. And I think I realize when I'm talking about this question, it's actually quite important. And this is, um, it's important even for discipleship. It's not just structure for structure's sake, but I believe church governments, it brings a church into discipleship and brings it to her vision. So there's a couple of reasons I, I have. Um, increased accountability. <laughs> Again, our lady says, you know who's at fault? <laughs> But I guess there, if you have a church, um, a great governance, there's accountability. You know who made the decision, you can go back and question, and you can balance each other out. And another thing is, again, clarity in decision making. Like if there's an issue in the church, people should know who makes the final decision. And if it's not clear who decides on the new children's program, or the new church, if they don't know, it can lead to a lot of problems. It could lead to a lot of arguments. It could lead to even dissension. And so it, it actually can cause disunity issues in the church as well. And again, um, church, good, 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 good church governance increases collaboration. Increases collaboration. Because I think as I discussed today, church governance cannot be just one person deciding everything. When you have good church governance, different people decide different things. And it's collaborative. You can discuss and discuss, but this person will make the decision. And then also with that plurality of leadership. I think a church with good governance has a healthy disciple-making church has disciples and mentors. And it happens at the top, too. A healthy disciple-making church has a plurality of leaders all working together to make decisions for the church. Okay, and I believe it, it helps the burden as well. Okay, it helps the burden as well. And I think when you have a plurality of leaderships, increased collaboration, I think there's less of what we call um, a bottleneck of decisions. 
if only one person is making decisions, sometimes you always have to wait for the answer going up and down, up and down. And sometimes that can be frustrating on both parts. The person waiting for the answer and the person giving the answer, they feel like there's so many things to decide. So again, great governance can just um, reduce the, the waiting time. And the last reason is model discipleship. Church governance really can model discipleship. It's a wonderful way to express discipleship. And I'm going to tell you why. Okay? It goes beyond structure. So after that, I think you're wondering, um, how does our church structure our governance? Okay, so I want to share how we structure our governance. I'm, I did some research because I wasn't there at the very beginning. So I did some research because the way we govern our church was very different when we were member 17 people and now we're 6,000. So the way we govern, is it going to be the same or different? So governing a church of 100 is very different than governing a church of 1,000. And a lot of times some churches, they, they used to be small. And when they become thousands and thousands, they still operate like a small. And they realize it becomes more and more challenging. So I'm going to tell you our little history. And again, I share you to get you to be thinking, not to just um, copy us, because every church is different. So this is the Covenant EFC church governance. And the first thing I want to share is who's ever making decisions, who's ever making decisions, they have to be um, a certain kind of disciple. <laughs> We don't put anyone in leadership decision making because they are skilled. Okay, we need a finance person. We should get the finance manager from a bank to do it. But that person's not even going to small group. So he's skilled, but he doesn't embody the value. So I think it's very, it is a great opportunity for discipleship. And we believe the, the board members should have certain um, values. And I talked about this at the IDMC clinic um, last year, so you can review the notes. But we believe every person at the top leadership should be modeling these values. So I'm not going to go over it because I went over it in November. Okay, so a theocentric compass, inner life composure, leadership clarity, friendship community, and commitment to character. So these are kind of like our qualifications. Okay, taking from the word of God. So let's go do a history lesson. Covenant started in 1962. 1962, okay, even before I was born. Okay, so it started from a small church called Emmanuel Evangelical Church. And that, it actually started as a youth group. Sound familiar? Okay, so a lot of new churches start off as youth group. And they, they broke off from Newton Life Church. Because Newton Life Church was a predominantly Chinese-speaking church. And when the, the children were born, they're more English-speaking, a different way of thinking. So they released them to start, not a church, but um, a fellowship as well. So for 1962, um, there was that. And then many, many years later, um, they're looking for, they had different senior pastors. And was, the church was actually started by um, a missionary. But in 1987, um, Pastor Eben Chan... Okay, Pastor Eben Chan. Okay, this is an interesting story I'll tell you is um, Pastor Ann was one of the original mem was one of the members of the church. There was only 17 or 30 people at the beginning. Pastor Ann was, wasn't a pastor back then. She was just Ann. And she was attending. She asked, can I bring my, my boyfriend? <laughs> and she said, who's her, your boyfriend? My boyfriend is Edmund. <laughs> and um, again, Edmund during that time was not going to church. Can you believe that? You know, so uh, Pastor Edmund describes those years in his youth. He was a backslidden, you know, kind of just a bit jaded with the church. Didn't really feel it was the right place for him. So he wasn't going to church. And then Anne brought him to church. Okay, so. Single people are asking if that can be a model. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is a grace. But he was a believer. He was a believer. He was a believer. <laughs> yeah, so he brought. And then Edmund came. Yeah, okay. So it is true in the Bible, it says, um, it is true in the, the Bible where it says um, there was no suitable helper for the man and a woman was assigned to be the helper. But helper does not mean wash the floor and mop the, mop the thing. Helper is a very high thing. Like when it says um, God helped Israel, it means actually you can translate it as saved. <laughs> So Pastor Ann saved Edmund. <laughs> so 
girlfriend and boyfriend, the girlfriend you saved your man. <laughs> okay, so um, again, it's not a model, it's just a, a story. <laughs> okay? So when Edmund, uh, Edmund Chan came to the church, he began to grow, and the church saw the leadership potential in him, and they sent him to, um, to Bible college. And when he graduated, I think he was only 23 years old, um, they asked him, there was a leadership crisis in the church, there was no, the senior pastor had left, and they asked him, can you be um, our interim senior pastor? And he prayed over it, and he joined in 87. So when he joined, he was a senior pastor, and there was a, a senior pastor and a board. But the church was small. The church was small. So back then, we were one church, okay? So we had the senior pastor, which is Pastor Eben Chan, and he worked with the church board. So there's a separate board of just lay, lay people, lay leaders. So there's Pastor Eben Chan, and there was a group of lay leaders. And... What they did, because the church was small, the church board was composed of ministry leaders, like in charge of worship. So it was, it, the, the board was in doing, overseeing ministry and working closely with the senior pastor. So they're working together to run the church. Okay, so when they decided to rent a property, they just talked amongst themselves and came to a decision. Because it's small, it was that way. So under that was, uh, there was a few full-time staff at that point. And again, lay leaders. So the lay leaders of the ministries, the children, the small groups, they all reported to the church board and full-time staff. So it was kind of all together. And then the members were there. So this lasted for many, many, many years. Okay, so this, mass, so this is um, the charting our growth of our church. I think I shared this last year as well. Is Again, Covenant started officially in 1970 under Pastor Ben Chan, and again, started with 17. And during this time, for many, many years, it was a very small church. Um, but then in 1998 uh, into 2000, it, it just a lot, there's a huge amount of growth. Okay, and a lot of our growth, again, for this, we call these our foundation years where we just grounded people in the word, um, in the word of God, and in prayer. And then during this time, we always wanted to find our own property, but we couldn't. So we're just called the, the nomadic church. <laughs> okay, we just moved from place to place until they kicked us out. <laughs> and you know, in Singapore, it's, it's a lot. So in the year, um, in the year 2000, God allowed us to buy our first property. And there was a piece of property um, for sale for, I think, $16 million. So at that time, 350 people raising $16 million Singapore dollars. That is a huge feat. But by faith and by, um, by following the vision of the Lord, they did it. And once we got our, our building, um, the, the attendance really increased because we had the capacity. So when we reached 1,000, things began to change. We realized we could not, there's, once you have a building, there's more decisions to be made. There's a lot of technical things, and, and it, we found the church board, this, the church board was getting bogged down with a lot of items to talk about. Like what color is the carpet? <laughs> you know, um, what's next year's pulpit schedule? So all of those decisions were made at this level. Big decisions, small decisions. So it became very complex. Board meetings would go all the way to midnight, 1 a.m., 2 a.m., because there's so many things to talk about. And so there, I think at that time they decided to make a change. Because our church is big, we cannot operate like a small church. So we had to split our functions. We had to split our functions. And this is what they did. Um, they decided that the senior pastor and the staff will be in charge of the spiritual direction of the church. And they said the church board will be in charge of the policy and operation and the vision of the church. Okay? So I know this sounds like big words, but it really has um, very specific effects down the line. So again, this became the new structure. Oh, I'm not sure why this is happening again. Okay. So this became the new structure. And especially we had, um, this is our first center, opened in 2000. And then God led us also um, eight years later um, to start another center, Woodland Center. And then another eight years again is the East Center. So we had three centers again and one senior pastor. I think it's very similar to now, right, in Destiny. There's one senior pastor and three centers. So the decision, we're going to still be one church with three centers. 
and it was decisions how we're going to organize and structure our church. So this is, and we did had at this, um, we had two senior pastors, and then we also had we call a senior pastor's office. Okay, so at this point, when we had three centers, we realized there's too many decisions to be made by one person. So we, they had a senior pastor's office, which is made up of Pastor Kei Kyung, Pastor Tony, and then the other pastors are the ones in charge of the centers. Does that make sense? So it's like a core team of the, of the leaders in this team. Okay, and this is the church board still continue to exist. They're nominated, they're elected, and they're all lay people. They're all marketplace folks. And this is how we structure it now. So we still have a senior pastor. <laughs> um, pastor Evan Chan has stepped down, so we pass it to Pastor Tony and Pastor Kei Kyung. And we have a board. And the reason why I separate it is now they have two different functions. The senior pastor talks about the spiritual things of the church. So all the spiritual ministry decisions are handled by the senior pastor and the senior pastor's office. So in the senior pastor's office, you, dele you delegate. This pastor is overseeing the worship for all three satellites. This pastor is overseeing the equipping for all three satellites. It's like that. Okay. And they oversee the full-time staff. And then the lay leaders. So all the lay leaders report directly to the senior pastor. So the lay leaders no longer report to the board. So the board composition has changed. It's no longer the leaders of the, of the ministry. The church board is made up of people who can, who can think. Who, everyone can think, but who can think of, at the policy level, a, a high level strategic thinking of the future. Okay? And so the church board has a chairman. And by structure, the senior pastor reports to the chairman. So if you ask in covenant who's the most powerful person in the church, it's the chairman. <laughs> okay, because the chairman is the one who is holding the rest of the church accountable. So the, the chairman of the church board um, approves the leave of the senior pastor, <laughs> approves his trips. Okay, so in, that's the way it works. Okay, so the church board establishes all these policies and future direction of the church. So I'll talk more about this later, but you can see the big picture, right? So all three centers are all under this. We have one senior, two senior pastors, and one board. Okay, so that is uh, how we govern a multi center church. So in the future, this may change again. Because we are going to plant another church in another few years. And the question is, how many churches can be sustained by one church board? I mean, if we, if we plant 10 churches, is it really possible? It just, can you just imagine? We might have to think of another model. So in 10 years down the line, and 30 years down the line, we may have to just release the churches to be independent churches with their own separate boards, their own senior pastors. We're still friends. It's not a split. <laughs> it's a natural birthing out. So I hope you can see the progression of how the church governance changes depending on the size of the church. And now we also have above the church board uh, people that have been aboard for the long time. We have a council of elders. These are people who have been with the church for a long time, but they're no longer, they've stepped down from the church board to allow new people to do it. But the Council of Elders meets to talk about the future of the church. Like 10 years down the line, 20 years down the line. So um, when Pastor Edmund Chan announced that he was going to retire and step down, he told them, like I think 15 years in advance. Okay, so the Council of Elders actually had a plan for what Pastor Evan Chan was going to do in the future. So they, they talked about these things, the future of Pastor Evan Chan's ministry. And it's out of that came his, this IDMC Global Alliance thing. So these are, the, these are things that are important to the church, but sometimes we don't have time at the ministry level to talk about it. So we put people aside to do it. Okay? So that is a church structure. So firstly, I want to talk about in the church leadership in your notes is um, church leadership relationships. Okay, say the word relationships. relationships. The key to great church governance is relationships. Relationships. 
And I'm just going to leave you with one word. The key to leadership relationship is what word? Is what word? <laughs> What is the word? The key to leadership relationship is the same word as the key to intimacy with God is what? Trust. What is true with our relationship with the Lord is true with our relationship with others. The key to leadership relationship is trust. So turn to your neighbor and say, I trust you. <laughs> trust. You can have the greatest church structure. You can have everything organized on paper. But there, if, if there is not trust, it's not going to work. People will just be fulfilling their jobs and their positions. So trust is really key before you embark on having good governance. Okay, so building trust is bigger than tactics. It's your entire mission. Because there's, when there's no trust... When decisions are made, you will question. You will fight. And sometimes if you don't trust this person, if this person makes a decision, generally you don't want to do it. <laughs> but if there's deep trust, deep mutual submission, then it can be very beautiful. Okay, so the opposite of trust is mistrust. <laughs> Mistrust, right? So I want to give you a picture of um, Patrick um, Lesioni's book, The Culture of Mistrust. When there's not trust in church governance, this is what can happen. There could be, there's absence of trust. There's fear of conflict. That means some people will not share what they really feel about the church decision. Okay? There might be a lack of commitment. There might be avoidance of accountability and inattention to results. Inattention to results. So these are things that sometimes happen in a church. Okay, so in, in uh, one, when the church I grew up in, there was really a lack of trust in the church board and church governance. And they could never make decisions to move the church forward. And because they couldn't, eventually there was a point it wasn't over the carpet of the floor, but a decision was made. It was a very small decision, but because there was lack of trust, it blew up, and the church split. And the church split. And I think the decision was very simple, who to hire as the next worship leader. <laughs> but it's not about the decision, but it was about how they handled that conflict. And because there wasn't trust, it, it just escalated into many issues. But when there is trust, when there is trust, you have a wonderful picture of governance. And I talked about this again last year in the IDMC clinic. So look at your notes again. This is the control and compliance model of governance. And this is our goal. We want to have a governance, a mutuality of trust. And when there's trust in governance, it's beautiful. Rights are released. There's maturity, it's trust, work is a calling, allows for ambiguity, all these things. There's empowerment, it liberates, there's mutual trust and submission. But when there's mistrust, all these other things can happen. And in our church, how do we build trust? There's three words. How do we build trust? And the first one is, is pray. <laughs> it's prayer. I, you know, I, I, I heard a Pastor Carl talking about the prayer journey destiny is undergoing. And I believe when God's people pray together, God does something to you. God brings you closer together. Because the thing is, when people who pray together stay together. Because when you pray, your heart is no longer your own agenda. It is God's agenda. So if everyone is seeking for God's agenda, and we all trust the Lord then we will certainly work together well, right? I find out in many relationships, like marriage relationships, when the husband and wife are not praying together, I find there's, there's generally a lack of trust. And it's a sign that they are maybe not so connected spiritually. So our board members, we don't pray every day at 5 a.m., I'm sorry, <laughs> like you all do, but we pray 6 a.m., close, every Saturday morning at 6 a.m. They pray together. And this is one of the things that Pastor Edmund Chan, when he became senior pastor, he says, I want the board members and me to pray every Saturday. 
So from 6 o'clock, I think, to, um, to 6 to 6.30, um, one of the elders, one of the board members will share a, a devotion. And then they'll, they'll all gather and they'll just pray. And they'll just pray for the church, pray for themselves. And then from 6.30 to 7.30, they, they eat together. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> Okay, so praying before eat, and they eat together. And as they're eating, you don't eat with people you don't trust, right? <laughs> you don't, right? You don't eat with your enemies, unless you're going to poison them, right? <laughs> okay, so afterwards they eat. And it's amazing, when they eat, they're not just talking about the good food. They begin talking about issues in the church, informally. Like saying, I have this great idea about how to move our church. What do you think? And over breakfast, they're talking about it casually. And we find a lot of the best ideas that Covenant has gone forward is through this um, weekly, we call it dawn prayer. And I think this is a way, this is why our board has such good relationships. And I attended their prayer meetings for two months just to have a taste. And I, I tell you, it really, I really sense their agenda is the Lord. There's no personal agendas. Sometimes people join the board because they don't like something and they want to change something. So going on the board, they can change. Or they want to be a voice of dissension. Oh, you know, Pastor Edmund Chan is too powerful. We, we need someone to oppose him. It's like, so they join to have a separate voice. But again, this is not the purpose of the board. The purpose of the board is to seek God's agenda and to follow him. So we have pray, eat, and last one is love. <laughs> they really love each other as well. <laughs> okay, so I think, it was, I think in the movie it's called Eat, Pray, Love, but I put pray, eat, love. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so again, there's a mutual love. And again, um, they realize um, for the church board, it is not just the men, but any, all the spouses fully support their husband or wife to be on the board. And if the spouse has reservations about going on the board, we do not allow it. There has to be that unity together. So a few times together, all the board members and their wives will come together um, to just pray together. And, and, and I can just tell you that it's just a beautiful picture. Okay, so you have eat and you have, um, you have pray, eat, and you have love. <laughs> okay, so in your, uh, I want to, once you have it to, to discuss with your people next to you, is in your ministry amongst your leaders, how do you build trust? What are you doing to build trust amongst your key leaders in the church? Okay? So take a moment with your partner. Just to, I will not give you the microphone. This is just your talking time. Okay? Just your talking time. So with, your, um, with the people around you, why don't you just brainstorm? How is trust built in your leaders in your church? How is trust built? How do you do it? And I just want to share, um, I forgot, I want to share one more thing of how uh, our church board builds trust. It builds trust. So one thing um, uh, our, one of our senior pastors does, so the church board, you have both senior pastors, um, uh, Pastor Tony and Pastor Kay Kilo, and they're very intentional about building the trust. So not only do they pray every Saturday, but I forgot to mention this, um, they really love each of the board members a as people. <laughs> So, um, as, opposed to, as opposed to something else, right? So they, they really love them, and what they do is um, Pastor Tony um, personally has lunch with each board member. He takes turns. He has one-on-one -on -one lunch with every one of the board members. And he just goes right through them one-on-one. -on -one. And the purpose of that one-on-one -on -one is just get to know and to pray for them. And he intentionally schedules it into a schedule that he will plan a one-on-one -on -one meeting with one of the board members just to pray for them and to see how they're doing. And I believe when he does that, um, he really builds trust. Because when Pastor Tony was a new pastor, he, he, he was kind of like, he didn't grow up in covenant. He was from another ministry. So when he came, the church was already a thousand. So when he came, a lot of people were thinking, like, who's this guy? <laughs> And the first task for him was to build trust. So he met with every single one of the board members and, and just um, got to know them. And then the board members realized he had no agenda. 
His agenda was just to be a disciple of the Lord. So I think this is something um, I'm, I can take away from this as well because I'm also a ministry leader. And at the end of the year, our church is something very different. Um, the church decided to um, evaluate each other. <laughs> So everyone was given um, some forms, and the form was supposed to be like, you're supposed to give to someone in staff, what do you affirm about Pastor Andy? <laughs> and what do you do not like about Pastor Andy? <laughs> and what can you improve about Pastor Andy? Okay, so we are an authentic, authentic community. But they told us when you give it to the person, tell them don't put their name on it. <laughs> Just make it anonymous so that it can be truly authentic. So I decided who, which of the 10 people you want to give it to. So I gave it to 10 different staff members. And when I got the response back, I, I was very surprised um, at one person's response. And the person wrote their name as well. <laughs> OK, so I'm like, OK, they really want to send me a message. <laughs> <laughs> so I, and I said, OK. They said, you know, Pastor Andy, I've been sitting next to you um, in the office for the past year, and never once did you ask me how I'm doing, like what my life is going on. I see you rushing around, you know, ha having different meetings, and um, she says, I wish you would do that more. So when I first heard that it was a real wake-up call, um, of course I made some excuses. I said, well, because she's not in my department, <laughs> she's another ministry, you know, but but she's really sitting right next to me. So I, later on, I, I really went to her and I apologized for my behavior and that you know we're, we want to be building relationships here. I apologize. And I said, no, how are you doing? <laughs> you know, I try to be genuine about it, but I mean, that's what she wants, right? I don't, I don't know what else to do, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so again, um, building trust, it must be intentional. Intentional praying, intentional eating. It just will not happen. Just like discipleship, it doesn't just happen. We have to be intentional about it, okay? So trust is, is quite important. Okay? So again, the key to um, building church leadership is what's the word again? Trust, trust, trust. Okay, so um, beyond that, I'm going to talk um, beyond this. I want to talk about... We have church leadership relationships. And the next one is church um, leadership roles. OK, so turn to your partner and say, what is your role? <laughs> OK, what is your role? OK, what are you supposed to be doing? OK, and I think sometimes people are not clear what their role is. OK, when people are not clear, people sometimes don't feel empowered. You know, have you ever had a great idea in church and you think you can implement it, but then someone says you can't do that and you feel a bit stifled? So sometimes it's because it's not really clear what your role is. And so let me just clarify very quickly, what is the role of the church board and what is the role of the senior pastor? I talked about this a little bit, but I'm going to get more specific and I think they're all in your notebook as well. So the, the first role is to give direction to the church and set policies. Okay, so the board really decides that the direction of our church is disciple making. Okay, we're, we're going to go in that direction. It's our core value, and they're going to set policies. Okay, policies can be HR policies, finance policies, um, hiring policies, all these um, things that generally some pastors don't want to think about. <laughs> okay, it, it, it takes that burden off the pastoral staff so they can focus on the spiritual aspect of the church. And really importantly, model church values. So in our church, they model a discipleship. They model a certain kind. So for our church board, we believe they all should be um, discipling other people. They all should be serving. But again, we realize the calling and capacity of each of the board members is different. Some people are just discipling a few women. That's fine. Some people have four or five mentoring groups. That is fine. It doesn't matter, but just as long as in their own calling capacity, they are demonstrating discipleship, the church values. Secondly, governance in finances and administration. So how is money used? How is money used? This is very important. If you're gonna buy something for $500, who gives approval? 
If you're going to buy something that is $1,000, who gives approval? If you're going to buy $1,000, something that costs a million, who gives approval? And again, the pastor team can talk about all these things, but it's good to set aside a group that can do it for you. Okay? Um, and administration as well. Okay? Um, how many staff can we hire in our church? If we have a church of 6,000, what's the ratio of staff to members? And this is what the board should decide for us. For finances as well, if there's a surplus at the end of the year, let's say we don't use up all the money, where does that money go? <laughs> it cannot be one person say, we're going to give it to this charity <laughs> who happens to be a friend of the pastor, you know? It cannot be that way. So there's be clarity in how the money is to be used. I want to convert the fiancés. Yeah. What? Oh, fiancés. <laughs> Sorry that the automatic spell check. So they don't. Uh, they don't govern the the, the fiancés. <laughs> That's great. Wouldn't that be great if they did that? The church board did all the matchmaking. That'd be great, right? We can add that. You please <laughs> premarital counseling. You do all that, okay? <laughs> Thank you, finances. And the fourth one is an important one that you, we hope will never happen. But if it happens, we know there's a plan. It's resolve senior leadership matters. Resolve senior leadership matters. Let's say that the senior pastors, the senior pastors cannot get along. <laughs> they have discussed the issue, but they can't resolve it. The board can come and resolve it. Or let's say one of the senior leaders falls into sin. Who is going to deal with it? The board will deal with it. They'll, set, they'll discuss it. They'll decide what should be done, what should, the, what should the actions be, whether the person should step down or take a break. So these are the things the senior pastor should, the, the board should do. Of course, the other pastors will help along as well. But to have the independent party decide this, is, I find it's very healthy. It's very healthy. Resolve seniorship. Hopefully this will never happen, but it's good to have in place. And the last one is to convene committees and task force as necessary. So under the church, our church board is relatively small, but each one of the people in this board, they represent a committee. A committee. And I'll tell you what those committees are in a little bit. So that's the church board. Okay, any, any questions about what the church board does? This is, this is a workshop, so if you want to ask, any questions about the role of the church board? Okay, or well, we can just wait till, we can wait till the very end as well. Okay, we'll wait. so if you have any questions, you can just jot it down. Okay, now let's go to the role of the senior pastor. We're, we're very fortunate we have two, <laughs> okay? And that is already a bit, um, it took a while to understand there's two senior pastors. Because sometimes one pastor will say yes, other pastor will say no. <laughs> so like, who, is, who do we follow? But we've, we sorted that one out as well. <laughs> so the role of senior pastor is the spiritual authority of the church. So we believe the senior pastor is the one who prays and seeks the Lord at the direction of the church. What, what, what is the theme? What is, our what is our spiritual focus next year? Is it prayer? Is it the word of God? These things are decided by the senior pastor. It is not decided by the board. The board cannot say, oh, we don't like that idea. It is not. It is the senior pastor has been given the authority to handle spiritual matters in the church. Secondly, provide overall vision and direction for the church. So I, think, I believe in your church you have a vision 2020. In our church we have vision 2028. And vision 2028 is when we're, our covenant is 50 years old, celebrating our 50th anniversary. Okay. So Pastor Tony will celebrate our 50th anniversary by stepping down. <laughs> okay? So he, as a senior pastor, he can decide that and get the church to follow along with him. Okay? And most importantly, they model personal leadership. That is in both the church, but they model what it means to be a disciple. And again, just like in the Bible, the role of the senior pastor and the pastor is to lead the people, equip the flock, and release them for ministry. Okay, so our church board does not do the equipping. Okay, in other, some other churches, the church board, they, the, the elders will do teaching and preaching. But our, our church elders, they can teach, they, they can lead, but they don't have to. <laughs> it depends on gifting. So we do have some church board members who do teach, okay, but, but it's not requirement of them. 
their main role is to, to set the policies. And then finally, to exercise his giftedness. So that is the role of the senior pastor. So I hope you can see that the role of senior pastor and the board is very different. But they complement each other. They're not competing against each other, okay? They're not competing. They're complementing each other, okay? Now I want to talk about the, um, the role of committees and task force. So in the church board, um, there's a committee. And what does the committee do? The committee is a standing committee with a perpetual terms of reference and specific goals. So it's a standing committee that looks into policies of the church. So there, these are examples of the committee. There is a, a long-term strategic committee that looks into the long-term plans of the church. Okay, for example, um, our church is 6,000. What do we project it in 10 years' time? And how much money do we need to do? What kind of facilities do we need to do to hold that many people? So this is long-term strategy. Human resource, they look into the welfare of the pastors and the full-time staff. For example, do we get a raise every year? <laughs> how much vacation time do we get? Do we get medical, dental? These are all things the HR committee needs to address. Do pastors get sabbatical or not? These are decided by the board. It is not decided by the senior pastor. So these, th and also human resource is salaries as well, okay? Um, also there's a nomination committee because we nominate our elders. It's not selected by the senior pastor. So there's, there's a nomination process. And there's a finance audit for those finance people here, we must audit our finances. There's a large church in Singapore. They got pulled to court because some of the financial tra transactions was not very clear. So people were giving money to the building project, but the money was used for another church ministry. And actually, there's nothing wrong with, with taking money from other... There's nothing wrong with what they're doing, in a sense, that they're still reaching out. But the process was very fishy <laughs> because it didn't go through the board. <laughs> it went through a few people at the top. Okay, so they weren't charged because they were using money for this music. They were charged because of breach of trust. People gave money for this and it's been used for this. And if you're gonna change, you should let them know. <laughs> and the board should approve it. So that was the that was the thing that, that caused the big blow up, okay? Because the intentions are correct. The intentions is great is to bless the kingdom of God. But again, if things are not clear, um, people looking from the outside can, can really, really be um, stumbled, okay? Like for example, one thing our church dealt with, I was, this is my fault, you can blame me, the lady here, you can blame me. When t Typhoon um, Yolanda happened, when Typhoon Yolanda happened in the Philippines, our church wanted to help, so we, we had a fundraising, we had fund, who wants to give to Typhoon Yolanda? And then we sent teams to the Philippines to help with the relief. We did that, we raised a lot of money, and a lot of money came in. And we used that money for different projects, water projects, rebuilding home projects. But the funny thing is after it was all done, there was money left over. And people actually continued to give money into this fund. And I was in charge of it. <laughs> Three years later, someone was looking through, the auditor was looking through the bank accounts. What's this Typhoon Yolanda account? Oh, that was when we raised funds. Why is there still money in this account? <laughs> that was five years ago. Why wasn't it spent? And then I had to answer it because we already used it. And they said, you cannot do that. <laughs> you cannot take people's money and just have it sit there. <laughs> Because that's a breach of trust. People think this dollar is going to help someone in the Philippines, and it's still sitting in the bank account five years later. So we got, it was highlighted to us and to me <laughs> that we cannot do this anymore. So again, it was, I wasn't fired, thank you very much. <laughs> they said, okay, Pastor, when you do this again, please think through the, ask the finance how to do it. Because sometimes pastors have a great idea, they just do it. But sometimes I need the clarity from the finance department. They say, okay, it's okay to ask for money, but tell them we are raising like $10,000 for the project. Any money given above 10000 or not used will be put into our general missions account. Then everyone is happy. <laughs> you know, 
and then no one gets in trouble. So do you see how important um, having very clear governance is to a church? Um, because sometimes our intentions are always good, but sometimes the way it looks, it, it can be received wrongly. And in, in a sense, it is wrong to take people's money and not use it the way you said. So that's the committee. Okay, we also have a task force. A task force is short term, short term projects. A time defined committee with specific and specialized terms of reference. Okay, so it is just a, a temporary committee in many ways. So again, property search. We're thinking of starting a new center. We need to have a team of people looking for property. So we don't want to burden the pastor and the, the senior pastors to go call up real estate agents. Can you imagine all the week they're looking at different sites? This committee helps them do that. And they present it to the board, and then they visit it. And then um, building um, constitution review, we have a constitution. Um, and then uh, our vision, and again, sober aging generation. If there's a big issue in the church, we realize our church is getting old. <laughs> And we realize we don't know what to do. In 20 years, our church used to be young, you know, used to be, but then now there's an aging population of people above 50. And so they set up a task force just to talk about them, okay? Not about them, but how we can involve them. <laughs> how we can involve them and empower them in ministry, okay? Because our whole ministry model was how do we empower the young people, how we get them, you know? We need, we need a different strategy. Okay, so that is um, church leadership roles, okay? So I hope as um, you are evaluating this thing, you can find your place here as well. Okay, so finally, the last, the first one is church uh, leadership, what? Relationships, the first one was relationships. The second is church leadership roles, and the last one is church leadership responsibility. So here you find the answers to your quiz, okay? So in Covenant, we have five levels of decision making, okay? Five levels of decision making. And I find it gives us clarity. The first level is policy. Policy level. Who decides the policies of the church? You know, how often does a pastor go on leave, um, have a sabbatical? Um, what is the policy? And the decision maker is the board. The board decides all policies of the church. But of course, they invite the input of the senior pastor. So the senior pastor can give input, but the board decides. So for example, the HR committee has decided this is the package we give new employees. The senior pastor can give feedback, but the decision rests with the board. Okay? Secondly is executive decisions, ministry decisions. Okay? So decision making is a senior pastor with input by staff. Okay, so they're talking about should we, um, what is the pulpit schedule for next year? What books should we study next year? Should we have a new children's program? The board has no say in that. <laughs> they have no say in that. The senior pastor is given the spiritual authority to lead the ministries. So the senior pastor will make that decision with input by the staff. Okay? So if the children's ministry worker wants to do a brand new thing with the children, they ask the senior pastor for permission, and he says yes or no. Okay, so that's how it works here. Then finally, level four and five are operational decisions. For example, should we buy a new guitar for the worship team? <laughs> it doesn't go to the board. <laughs> it doesn't go to the senior pastor. <laughs> Okay, it goes to um, the joint decision of senior pastor, staff, and lay leaders. So many times we empower the lay leader to make that decision. Okay, so for us, if it's a money matter, if it's, if it's less than like maybe $500, you can just sign off. But if it's going to be like $1,000, $500,000, the senior pastor will have to sign his name. Okay? So a lot of this is, is broken down into very, very specifics as well. So we have operational decisions. Okay, so again, this frees the board to think about big picture. It frees the senior pastor to think of the direction of the church, and it leaves all those smaller decisions up to the, um, uh, up to the, the staff and the lay leaders. So here's your five levels of decision making. Okay, so let's go to your quiz again. 
Okay, let's go to your quiz, and I'm going to check how well you've been listening as well. So um, tell me the answer is level one, level two, three, or level four and five for the answer, okay? This is to, to test how well you've been listening, okay? So um, the first one is whether to buy or rent a church building. What level is that? Level? Level one. You are so smart. <laughs> you get a start at level one. It's because it involves a lot of money, involves the big picture of the church direction, and it's decided by the board. Okay, next question, the number of new staff. Should we hire two pastors next year or one pastor next year? Who decides that? Level one. It is not decided, but the senior pastor can input, but the church board makes that final decision. Okay? Next is whether to start a new children's program is level what? Level two, level three. It doesn't go to the board. In many churches I work with, it goes to the board. And the board meetings last until 3 a.m. <laughs> okay, the pulpit schedule, who decides what we're going to preach each week is going to be? Yep, level two and three. The senior pastor does that. He does not have to consult the board. Okay, the board can give input. He said, well, last year you preached on Matthew, and you're preaching Matthew again. <laughs> you can give input like that. Okay, didn't we preach on that before? So um, the color of the carpet will be level four and five. Okay, so buying a, a guitar, the carpet, you know, all these things don't have to be decided at the top. When you're a small church, everyone decides. But now you're a church big, so things need to be different. And finally, the salary of the pastor and staff is done by what? Yeah, L, is it, would it be L2 or 3? No, L1. Okay, so we totally separate the salary from the senior pastor, which I think is a very good thing, <laughs> that someone else is establishing your salary as well. Okay, so um, again, in, the, in our church, the only person that knows, I think this is a good fact, the only, in our church we have a policy as well, uh, uh, that a staff member can never tell another staff member how much their salary is. It's a, it's, it's a, a policy. We are not, we're forbidden or forbidden. We're forbidden to talk about how much salary we're getting between staff. Right? I, I thought we're authentic. I thought we're authentic in our church. We're, doesn't it go down to salary? And they said no. Because sometimes we want to protect your heart. <laughs> the moment you hear what someone else is making, Human nature, you will compare it to yourself. So we are not allowed to know the salaries of, the, of, of our colleagues. The only person that knows the salary of everyone on staff is the board and also the senior pastor. <laughs> because he's just, he just knows, he doesn't influence, but he knows what people are getting. And the rest of the people are totally in the dark. And I think that's good for our soul. <laughs> it's good for us. It's good for our soul. Wow, it's so good. Okay. <laughs> and then, um, then the last one is the yearly budget. Who decides? Yes. Yeah, the board decides the budget. So I'm um, doing budget time in Singapore, July, November. They have two or three board meetings to discuss the budget. So this, the senior pastor will gather all the staff, all the ministry heads to devise, to devise the budget for the next year. And then the, the budget will be presented to the board. And then the board is allowed to ask questions. It's like, oh, you know, last year you spent this much, but now you're increasing it by so much. Why? It's very big picture questions. They don't ask, why are you spending $20 to buy this? So they're asking very big picture questions. And then sometimes we can revise it and bring it back. Okay, so this is, I, I feel it's a very good um, uh, checks and balances as well. Okay, so I hope that is clear and useful as you move forward in your church governance, okay? Um, but I just want to remind ourselves of what we began is, who's the boss? <laughs> who's the boss? And although the church board member, and they're all positions of power, but the real power is where? <laughs> the real power is the Lord. Yes. And it's something that is a key to church governance, is we must remember the person who is leading the church is not the board, is not the senior pastor, it is who? Jesus Christ himself. And this is what the word says, that Christ is the what of the church? He is the head of the church. He himself being savior of the body. 
So who's the boss? It is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. And it's great to know the church is in the hands of Jesus Christ. It's very releasing to remind ourselves the church does not belong to us. It belongs to Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. So let me just, I'll just, let me just close our prayer, close this time in prayer, and then I think we have some time for open questions, okay? Open questions as well. So let me just pray for us first. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you're the head of the church, Lord. And you're a God of order, you're a God of structure, Lord. So I thank you, Lord, you allow us to, um, to think who makes the decisions in our church, Lord, to prevent dissension, to increase resonance, Lord, because when the church is resonating and working well together, they can fulfill your destiny, Lord. When the church is arguing, when the church is, has issues within itself, the church cannot move forward, Lord. So, Lord, we pray, Lord, that we'll keep our eyes on you, Lord. And we know, Lord, that you will be trusting you, that you will lead our church in the future of his great destiny. And all God's people say together, amen. Okay, at this time, I will um, open it up for questions. Uh, pastor Andy, yeah, <laughs> thank you. Um, uh, I, I'm a pastor of a small church, and um, the, these kind of level of uh, structure doesn't really apply to us. But just out of curiosity, because I have been, uh, I have served like big churches. Uh, I, I was assigned in Korea, so in a perfect world, uh, the structure is great, and I, I am, I praise God that it is working out for Covenant. But um, just this is multi-layered. The, the question. So with the with the play, with the if everyone will allow me to ask multiple questions. No. Just, okay. I, I'm really sorry. But anyways, you, you, everyone will have to forgive me for this. No, but uh, first question: is, is it your policy to always include the input of the senior pastor when the board decides on something? Yeah, because the, the senior pastors is actually um, part of the board. Okay. So they're actually contributing members of the board. Always. Always. Okay. And many times, the board sees the senior pastor as their mentor. Nice. So it's interesting that it's, a, it's an interesting relationship. The senior pastor is their spiritual mentor, but the church board is in charge of all the policies. So it's really like a marriage. They have different roles. Right. And it's really good to hear the collaboration right. of the two. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Pastor. So really, you have to have a, a perfect culture of trust. I mean, <laughs> yeah. perfect, near perfect. I mean, a near perfect yeah. um, culture of trust and love with each other. But just in case, Pastor, just in case, yeah. for example, the senior pastor would want to implement a program of the church, but Again, but what if the the board would not approve the budget, even though they were the, the church was capable? That that's a great question. Uh -huh. So, in a perfect world, everything is always yes, yes. Everything's great. But let's say uh, Pastor Tony introduced an idea, and the church board discussed it over time. Again, many of the agenda items are talked about over many times. So an issue, if he was going to do a big initiative, let's say, um, for example, um, in May, we're gonna have a city outreach. We're gonna have a massive rally, evangelistic rally in the National Sports Stadium of 30,000 people, okay? It's gonna cost money, <laughs> okay? So that has to be approved by the board. And let's say the board discusses it and they eventually say no then it won't happen. It won't happen. And the senior pastor will have to ask God, did I hear wrong? <laughs> or what happened? And you have to deal with that himself. Maybe it's a timing issue. A lot of times a timing issue. Even though you have the money, there is reasons that they might not see. And um, I think this is a, a very good um, 
it's a very good test of our discipleship, you know, and our security, you know. So it will be a really, it will be tough for the senior pastor um, to, re to let go of this and to say, we, if the church board says no, I will not do it. Yeah. All right. So I, I just asked it because you, you, you said that the, the senior pastor was the spiritual leader of the church. Yes, yes, yes. And uh, I just think it's counterintuitive, but uh, I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank no, it's you okay. For that question. <laughs> I, sorry for the I, answer, but sorry. No, I think I, I I'm trying to understand. I think I understand what you're getting. He's the spiritual authority of the church, but yet the church board isn't following him because he thinks it, it's true. But again, it's, sometimes it's a timing issue. They're not neglecting the idea usually or the whole idea, but maybe it's a timing issue or a resource issue. So I. I Without a, a, a concrete example, it, it, it's, it's a bit difficult. But again, in our case, the church board can say no. And then the senior pastor, will, because I believe if God has spoken to the senior pastor, he would, I believe he will say the same thing to the church board. And if the church board says no, then someone heard wrong. <laughs> you know? It, it is true, because it, it, the Lord can say yes, and the next door boomer is no. So they both have to go back and back until they, until they both come to a place. Because I don't believe God speaks to, if the, if the God really is speaking, if everyone's listening to the Lord, I believe he will bring it together. So that's why I say sometimes it's a, it's a great idea, but sometimes the timing is not the perfect time. And I believe that God speaks to each of the people. Yeah, so I hope that helps a lot. Can you just make a comment on deacons? Are they part of a deciding board? Oh, yeah. I, I didn't mention that. Uh, Pastor Tony likes to call them um, deacons, not demons. <laughs> okay, so in our church, we have elders and we have deacons. So we have both elders and deacons in the church board. And they both have the same um, contribution. They both have the same voting power. But usually deacons are for the, the newer members of the, the newer members of the board. Yeah, an elder is someone who has is been there longer, has established himself. Yeah, and and more and leading some ministry. Okay, but every church defines deacon d differently. Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, Pastor Andy, am I, are we correct in hearing that you said earlier that the board is nominated? Yes. Could could you tell us how the how long their term is? and how the nomination works. Okay, for your that's, it's, a big, it's a big question. So I, I can, actually I can connect you with the nomination committee as well, because it's all written down. Because I think in Singapore government, they require the, the nomination process to be very transparent. They require it. So they want to know how are, your, how are your board members nominated. But very briefly, um, during nom I think every board member has a term of like three to four years. They, they, there's a term, and after they come off the term, they can stand for re-election, okay, re-election, um, to be on the board again. And we're still a congregational church, so we will vote which members can go in or not. And the voting is by constitutional membership. And we have an annual general meeting once a year where we vote on these things. Okay, and for, but for, for people who want to enter the board, there's a nomination process. So basically, um, pastoral staff, leaders in the church can nominate people for the board. So there's a season where the nomination committee said, from this date to this date, you can nominate people in the church to be on the board. And people submit names, and they have to write different things. Then the nomination committee will look at all the names, and they will vet them. Because there's some requirements. Like you have to be a member of the church. They just have to just get some references about you. <laughs> Then they'll narrow it down, and then they'll put these names on the ballot to be voted on. And then they'll be into um, the board. Yeah. So that's, that's in a brief, that's how, that, that's how it happens. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just a follow-up. Uh, so you said uh, those, those who nominate are uh, leaders and... I believe it's um, like an email goes out <laughs> to the, the leaders um, to nominate... Oh, members. Specifically, like, like what leaders? Life group leaders? Or? Oh, I think for us, it's, okay, number one, pastoral ministry staff. And I think what we have, like, our, our, our zone mentors, we call them, like the, 
uh, the zone mentors are the ones in charge of like five life groups or five cell groups. They're like the leaders of the leaders. So it's not a big group. Okay, I have to clarify. Um, I don't. I don't think members can nominate. I think only leaders can nominate other because they would know uh, the people a little better. Okay, so it's there's a certain people who can nominate um, the board members. Okay, only because our church is is big. <laughs> Maybe our church was smaller. We don't have that requirement because a church of six thousand. You can you imagine getting six thousand, like a thousand names. We have to find a way to, to vet them a bit easier. Okay. Yeah. Question. Do you have the minimum qualifications for deacons, elders, etc.? Yeah, I don't have the qualifications with me, but once once I um, I mentioned the values. Uh, of the ministry, but I don't have the, the, the qualifications. Obviously, the ones from the Bible are good. The character ones are quite important. And we also require like number of years in the church, like um, number of years of member, number of years serving. So uh, there's the requirements for it is, is quite high. And usually people who are nominated to our board, we known them for a long time. Because in our church, we believe in authentic discipleship. So we don't we don't hire new staff. We don't nominate people on the board unless we've known them for many, many, many years. Because when you know someone for many years, you know their true colors. <laughs> because on paper, a person can sound amazing. So we, 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 we want to be very careful. I think the principle here is we need to be, I don't want to say careful, but we need to be very stringent of who we allow on the board. We do. Because right now, our covenant board is, they're harmonious. They get along. But before Pastor Emin Chan came on, the board was very, it was a lot of different opinions. They weren't together. So a lot of the board meetings were arguing a lot about things. Like one argument the board members had is, should we tie salary to performance? You know, if I am doing more work, I should be paid more. If I'm reaching more people, I should be paid more. And they, they talked about that for a long time, okay? And eventually they said um, sa uh, pastor salary should not be pegged to performance. And then that board member got very upset. Okay, then he quit. Okay, so again, uh, we want to make sure people who are on the board are there, have the right heart. Because if you have one person that has the wrong, the different thinking wrong heart, they really can, they can just bring the whole board meeting down, spiraling downwards. So one thing we always teach our board members is it, we, we, you feel free to disagree, but never disengage. Do you understand the difference? And I've seen this happen in the board meeting. There's someone, there's one time this guy really felt strongly against everyone else. He said, I don't like this idea. I'm not gonna, I don't want to do it. I, I just want to share what I think. But after his whole like, big thing, he says, but at the end of the day, whatever you decide, I want to follow. And I really felt he meant it. And these are the type of people you want on the board who can share openly. But if people don't agree with them, they will not disengage. They will not stop talking. They won't take it personally, which happens a lot. <laughs> So I think this is, this is something we need to watch for. That's why we think the values are, are quite important. OK, thank you. Oh. <laughs> Afterwards, we'll talk during the break, too. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so just just a, a quick personal, if you allow me, a personal question, please. Uh, you, you said about letting go of the three centers as independents. Yeah. Personally, Professor, do, do you think that would be better for Covenant or? Not? Oh, personally. Yes, personally. Oh, I, I, I think it's a great idea. Hmm. I think it's a great idea because um, when you, planting two churches is very different than planting 10 churches. Because two churches, you really can collaborate a lot easier. You can collaborate a lot easier. You can do things together. But when you get five or six centers, can you imagine having everyone like doing the same thing, having the same theme, having the same preaching schedule. It's impossible, it's very difficult. So for now, when we preach a sermon, we have three centers, three pastors, we preach on the same text. And we, we, we agree on the same title. 
and we agree on the same outline. <laughs> in the amount of time it takes for the three pastors to come to a consensus, it's a wonderful collaboration. But can you imagine that there's five centers, five preachers? We will never decide. We'll spend more time trying to agree than to prepare the word of God. <laughs> And that's what's happening now. Now that we have our third center, we're spending more time making sure we're doing things together rather than doing the work that we're supposed to do. So I believe we need to release them rather than control them. Yeah, so I think this is something in the future we are looking at that we will release um, these churches to be independent, uh, have their own board, have their own senior pastor, then they really can fly. But right now, we're basically doing everything the same. We have church camp the same. Our preaching schedule is the same. Our, everything's the same. But I can already tell it's, it's very difficult. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Last one question. Yeah. All right. Okay. Hi, hello. Good afternoon. Uh, so I, I'm just interested with the way the, uh, the board and the senior pastor's functions are. When it comes to, especially when you have uh, church-based programs, wherein there's a need for you to collaborate with, let's say, the local government or Christian nonprofits. Yes. So who actually develops the, the memorandum of agreement, the guidelines, and who decides upon them? Let's say there are partnerships that are needed to be done. OK, so let's say, um, okay, for example, we're doing this uh, rally this rally for evangelism next month, and we need to use a national sports stadium. Because it involves thousands of people, we need to have permission from the government. Because Singapore, um, religious harmony is very important. You cannot just like, you have to be very careful not to seem like you're, you're, you're um, putting down other religions. So we had to get approval from the, the, the prime minister himself. <laughs> yes. So they had to draft a letter and a formal agreement. Of and because, um, and the letter has to come from, who would the letter be come from? Would it come from senior pastor or the chairman? Yeah. Chairman, yeah. right? Because the chairman is the quote unquote the most powerful person in the church. So the chairman needs to, to draft that letter. Of course, everyone can help them, but it needs to come from the church board. Because the church board not only is a policy issue, it's also a legal entity as well. Because in Singapore, you have to have a church board in order to be um, a church. So that church board is the one who will, um, le um, will, will stamp the letter. OK, but we all can work on it together. OK, that's a great question. Well, these, my mind is, 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 is I have, they're so technical. <laughs> I'm not used to talking about these things. <laughs> I'm used to preaching. <laughs> okay, so. OK, so any other questions, you can just catch me later as well. Okay, so after this, I can give these slides, I can give to you all if you want as well, no problem. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. All right, can we give the Lord the clap of praise? All right. Well, thank you, Pastor Andy, for the wisdom. <laughs> anyway, um, so we're going to have a 15-minute break. So um, you, can, um, you can use the restroom or you can just share to your seatmate any takeaways from, from the message. So we'll be back at 4.15. All right.